Good morning, everybody, or good day, wherever you are in, uh, in the world for this virtual seminar from the MIT Industrial Liaison Program. My name is Ron Spangler. I'm a program director in the manufacturing group here in MIT Corporate Relations, and I'm glad that you could join us. I wish that uh, it would be under better circumstances and we could all be um, on campus, and I hope you'll come and visit us soon. What we hope to do today in the next two hours for you is to share some of the thinking that MIT has put together in the last couple of years about the future of manufacturing. And we will obviously look at it through the lens of COVID-19 and the pandemic and try to evaluate how disruption might accelerate some of the changes that our experts have predicted or potentially even um, adjust them or redirect them. We have two excellent speakers. Uh, Liz Reynolds will be speaking first about the human side of manufacturing and disruption. And then Ollie Dweck will speak more on the manufacturing systems side. Let me introduce uh, Liz Reynolds first and then hand it over directly to her. Liz is a principal research scientist and lecturer in MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning where she received her PhD. Liz is the executive director of the MIT Industrial Performance Center and she's also the executive director of the Institute-wide Work of the Future Initiative, which was created in 2018, and which she co-leads with professors David Mindell and David O'Tour. Liz's research focuses on issues related to systems of innovation, advanced manufacturing, and regional economic impact. Her current research focuses on manufacturing ecosystems, growing innovative companies to scale and building innovation capacity, in both developed and developing economies. Before coming to MIT for her PhD, Liz was the director of the city advisory practice for the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, which was a nonprofit founded by Professor Michael Porter focused on job and business growth in urban areas. Liz is a member of the Massachusetts Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative and more recently the Massachusetts Emergency Response Team set up in the face of COVID-19 to increase the state's production of personal protective equipment. Liz, over to you. Great. Thank you, Ron. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, again, wish we were all um, uh, together uh, physically, but uh, I know we're, we're doing the best we can and MIT is doing the best it can. And I wanna say a few things uh, before I begin speaking, which, which are a few caveats. The first is to say, as Ron pointed out, I am not an engineer. Uh, I have a background in economics and um, my approach to this topic is, is an approach from a social science perspective. So there are many of you in the audience who have much more um, expertise in actual technology. And Ollie, of course, can answer a lot of the questions you might have on that front. Um, the other point I wanna make is that uh, when we named Work of the Future, this new initiative uh, that President Reif launched in the spring of 2018, um, we had, uh, two things, I think, in mind. The first was to say that this was, we, you know, we weren't trying to be clever uh, in, in not calling this the future of work, which is what we often hear about from people. Um, but what we, what we were trying to say is assert that there, you know, that the issues are um, about work of the future. There will be work in the future. Uh, our question is, you know, the question is not, will there be work, but, you know, what is the quality of the work? What is the accessibility of the work? Currently, of course, under the COVID-19 situation, uh, a lot of the dynamics of how we've understood the labor market, uh, which just a few months ago was, you know, practically considered a full, uh, full employment, you know, have changed dramatically. But the point was to say, you know, we're focused on on, on work of the future and and what that looks like um, in terms of uh, quality and access for everyone. The other point is. Um, that when um, we talk about work of the future, we're not talking about technology of the future. Our effort has been to focus on exactly what's going on with uh, work as it relates to workers, tasks, skills, et cetera. So that also, as Ron said, will be a little bit more of the angle I take in this, uh, in this work. And then of course, finally, the point about a lot of the research I'll be talking about here has taken place in the last year or so uh, under very dramatic um, you know, dramatically different conditions. And so we keep that in mind. I will certainly talk to, um, as part of this talk, what we see um, sort of in the near term here, but uh, that is something that, you know, things have changed. Many things have changed forever. Some things have not. 
uh, changed and will come back. And I think that's something we'll all be in the process of figuring out in the near future. So let me begin and I'm gonna um, just share my outline here. I'm gonna spend um, a little bit of time with an overview of our effort here at MIT, as well as some of the kind of, I'd say, foundational premise that we make about, um, about the labor market and about um, what we see happening um, in terms of new, you know, different dynamics. I'm gonna to speak to some of our initial research with specifically on manufacturing that's been going on as part of the initiative. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, my experience directly and kind of broader, you know, a broader understanding of, of what we think is going to change and, and what's going on with respect to COVID-19. So uh, with that in mind, let me turn first um, to uh, this um, billboard that I was uh, looking at driving in on, uh, on the pike to, to work for many months. And it was, I think, captured the zeitgeist of a year or two ago about, you know, the technology, the robots are coming, they're coming to take our jobs, they're going to take our children's jobs, and, uh, and we are just, um, you know, victims to this sort of technological determinism. Uh, I think this is in part what motivated the response by MIT and by President Reif to set up this initiative, um, this institute-wide initiative, which frankly, there's only happened a few times in the history of the Institute that, uh, that all five schools with representation, we have about 20 plus faculty members, uh, are part of something in which MIT felt a responsibility to say, well, yes, we're inventing this new technology, but we're also concerned with its, uh, the use of the technology, the implications of the technology for society at large. So with that in mind, the, um, uh, let me just sort of highlight, I think, what some of the um, indicators that this has been an important uh, and growing topic for the country. And I apologize ahead of time for a lot of the non-US um, uh, participants here. This is a, a fairly US-centric presentation, but of course, um, the, the work we're doing has a global perspective as well. But let me just look in the last you know, 10 months uh, in the US, what you would kind of what we've seen in terms of engagement on the question of work of the future. First and foremost, last August, we had the Business Roundtable, which has um, 200 of uh, the CEOs of the largest companies um, in the U.S. Um, as members come forward and say, you know, maybe we need to change our understanding of the purpose of the corporation and move from shareholder value, which has been a, a dominant um, a dominant sort of driver behind our understanding of the corporation since the 1970s um, in the States to stakeholder value, where we go back to an understanding of uh, the importance of customers, the importance of workers, a whole host of, um, of participants who are, have a stake in the, in the co corporation. You'll, many of you will remember the major strike at General Motors, 50,000 workers walk out, billions of dollars lost. Um, one of the largest strikes in recent memory. Um, again, workers out there striking for better benefits for their um, for the independent contractor or the uh, temp workers who didn't have the same kind of uh, benefits as full-time workers, uh, arguing that they need more health care, uh, a whole host of issues um, in which they were um, relatively successful. And then finally, the landmark uh, legislation passed by uh, California that was um, basically trying to address the issue of independent contractors and their rights and um, access to benefits, um, essentially sort of drivers for Uber and Lyft and others, a, a significant part of our, uh, of our workforce. And, um, and as we've seen with the COVID-19, a group who are quite vulnerable um, in moments uh, like this. So all of these uh, sort of, we have a, the, the business community uh, we have government, we have labor, we have all sorts of organizations and, and institutions coming forward to say, uh, we think there's a, a, an issue here, we need to rebalance um, some of our discussion about uh, workers and, uh, and prosperity in the country. And that um, has been uh, the focal point, I'd say, or I'd say the starting point for our work as part of work of the future. So for those who haven't seen it, we had a report, an interim report come out last fall uh, the work of the future, shaping technology and institutions. I think that's an important um, subtitle and, and, and sort of an oversees a lot of the work we're doing and thinking about this, that again, it's not, um, institutions can be shaped 
in uh, directions. We know that uh, given sort of the variety of ways we see states, for example, responding to the COVID-19 challenge, but we can also shape technology. Um, we make decisions uh, about where we invest, we make decisions about what problems we try and solve. And so if you haven't seen that report, or we have the website um, listed here, um, but I think it's, it's a, it's a very uh, good place to at least put the stake in the ground for us to say, what do we know? And this was, of course, last fall. What do we know to be true? Uh, what are the remaining questions? What can we try and um, respond to? And we will be having a final report come out um, next fall. So just a couple of um, grounding uh, slides to sort of talk about why these are, uh, why this is an important issue and why we sort of started this work uh, first and foremost around labor. Uh, the first point, and maybe many of you have seen this, but you know, why are we concerned about the robots coming to take our job? If it, one could argue that you know, if these these lines, which I will explain, if this graphic was different, we might not be so concerned. And if you look at other countries and look at the, the concern and the worry about will robots take your job, very different responses by the polling of the public between the U.S., for example, and Sweden's response, which may be a reflection of people's sense of economic security. But this chart shows us the diverging pathways of productivity growth in the US uh, in sort of from the 70s on and earnings in the US. And essentially those two bottom lines represent what we would call the median workers compensation as well as the compensation of kind of production and non-supervisory workers. And so while the average uh, workers compensation has tracked productivity fairly closely, when we take out the higher um, educated workers from that analysis, we see that largely for the median worker, uh, wages have really been relatively flat uh, over a, a very you know, decades. And this is very much fueling the insecurity people have, and they have good reason to be um, insecure and feel uncertain about the future and uncertain about technology and its impact on their jobs. And this plays out particularly uh, um, lower educated men uh, are particularly affected, uh, minorities are particularly affected. And interestingly, what um, some work by David Otter has shown is that the, uh, the fact that you used to move to the city to get on the, on the elevator up to your um, middle skill job or start at the low wage and move up, that that sort of urban pr wage premium has also disappeared. So it has a geographic dimension uh, as well here in terms of what's happening in terms of uh, both productivity and compensation. Another uh, factor that we need to take into account, oops, where am I moving here? Uh, why am I not moving forward? Hmm. Sorry, okay, here we go. Is this time different? So the first point, this is a question that we get a lot. Is this time, you know, this sort of introduction of new technologies uh, different than previous uh, periods, maybe the introduction of computers or uh, other stages in the history? And the fact is, is, as David Mendel would say, the historian on the team, he'd say, well, every time is different. But the question is, how is it different? So there's a couple dimensions in which we think this, is, this time is a little bit different. The first is around employment polarization, that what we know to be happening in the US economy, but also actually in economies um, around the world, is this hollowing out of the middle, that we've lost a lot of the middle skilled jobs that, um, that were perhaps had more routine in them. And so technology has played a role in reducing, for example, the number of production jobs or clerical jobs. Um, while at the same time, we have the growth of low skilled jobs. Here we see um, health, cleaning, um, uh, some retail jobs. And then the high end of jobs, so technicians, professionals, managers, data scientists, both growing and have been you know, growing historically quite um, at a strong pace. So this barbell economy, as David Otter often talks about, has created uh, a dynamic in which this increased inequality has, um, has been more apparent and I think part of uh, the motivation behind the concern about, about technology today. Another uh, factor that we've discussed is a, the concept of so-so technologies. This is a concept that uh, Daron Asimoglu from the economics department and his co-authors have put forward, which is, um, which is sort of an interesting idea, uh, particularly for those of you um, running firms and operations. Uh, 
we we understand technology has can have two potential um, you know ways in which it plays out. It can both substitute for labor and it also can complement labor. And often it's doing both of these things at the same time. Um, but we're, we we also know that not all innovations necessarily raise productivity. Um, that raise productivity displace workers, and not all innovation that displaces workers substantially raises productivity. So we have a couple examples here. You know, when we brought in um, electric lighting, huge complementary to, to labor, it increased the number of hours people could work, et cetera, et cetera, um, a huge boost. And that would boost low-skilled workers as well as high-skilled workers. You bring in something like self-checkout kiosks, uh, they certainly get rid of, you know, labor, um, but is the cost really leading to great changes in uh, productivity for the firm? Unclear. So one explanation for why we haven't seen substantial productivity growth in an age of so much new technology is this um, possibility that, well, maybe the technology we're introducing has not been really driving a lot of productivity growth. It's a little bit on the margins, getting rid of costs, et cetera. Another, obviously, um, argument that has been made by Eric Brynjolfsson and others is that it just takes a very long time to introduce new technologies and see their benefits um, downstream. And so that's perhaps something that many of you who are in introducing this new technology can appreciate, that uh, it takes time for an organization to adopt and really see the benefits of adoption of new technology. One other factor I want to just raise, which again feels well, what I would say is it's the one thing we can be certain about going forward are the, uh, are the details and the, and the data we have around demographics. We're not certain about much, I think, uh, right now, uh, but we can certainly be sure about the demographics. And what we know to be true in the US, as it has been true in uh, Japan and in Europe, uh, other parts of the country, or, sorry, world, is that we have a aging workforce. And as a result, we are, uh, and that and combined with uh, decreasing fertility rates um, and uh, in, in, at least in the US um, decreases in immigration, we see the working age share of our population uh, declining. So if you look at the graphic I have um, up now, we see that from 2020 to 2040, we see a, a, a pretty much an overall decline in our working age adult population and an increase in the senior, senior adult population. So this, is, this remains true, uh, despite our issues right now with significant unemployment and you know, concerns that we'll be seeing that for the foreseeable future. Long-term, we will continue to have uh, a labor shortage issue. Um, we know also that over time we haven't the education levels of a lot of our workers are increasing. Um, we have a higher percentage of high school graduates, higher percentage of college graduates. And so um, there may be less interest in working in some of those lower skilled jobs. And, and to that extent, perhaps automation will be a silver lining to supporting some of that work while people's skills uh, are increased over time. So the demographic story is one I want to take it, tar, uh, talk to in part also because it really speaks to the manufacturers uh, in this country in the manufacturing case. We have had a shortage of workers uh, for a while in the manufacturing space. And given, again, the aging workforce and the lack of uh, movement of newer generations into manufacturing, this continues to be a long-term issue for manufacturers, I think, in, certainly in the U.S., and one that we we think should be um, something to keep in mind despite the, the current situation um, with the COVID crisis. So let me now switch to uh, some of the research we've been doing on manufacturing itself. Um, and I will, let me just say that there's a number of ways in which we've been approaching the topic of manufacturing from the Work of the Future initiative. One has been to be out interviewing both large and small firms uh, in the U.S., many places in the U.S., as well as in Germany, about their experience in adoption, adopting new technology, and um, with a particular focus by Julie Shaw on robotics. Uh, so that's one piece of the work that has been going on. There's also additional work that's looking specifically at different technologies. So uh, Julie's work on collaborative robotics, uh, John Hart's work on 3D printing uh, and the factory of the future, a lot of different ways in which the 
task force has been approaching this, this question of manufacturing. And uh, what, we, what we know to be true is that a lot of uh, technology and automation and issues, this has been um, a topic for manufacturers for decades. You know, the, the, the issue of introducing robotics, et cetera, has been something that the, um, the manufacturing community has been engaged with for, for, for many years. And so some of this is not new for manufacturing. The question um, is really about some of the newer types of uh, technology that are on the horizon and, and what that means for bringing manufacturing into the 21st century. So um, IoT, Industry 4.0, uh, AI-related questions, et cetera. So here just shows you some of the interviews we've been doing over the last year or so. And let me just um, turn to our the first point about what we've heard from large firms. Now, again, this is all pre-COVID and, um, and there's a lot to say here. I'm gonna keep it at a relatively high level. Hopefully others can uh, fill in and, and, um, and maybe ask questions that can bring more to the fore here. But there's a couple points to be made about what we see happening with large firms and technology adoption and work um, across, uh, across, I'd say, um, several different industries. The first is that, and I think this was somewhat surprising to us, that when we have talked about the implementation of new technologies, and of course, you know, large firms uh, are at the forefront of a lot of this, that what we heard from a lot of people was that it needs to be complementary and not just this top-down process of flipping factories. Uh, what we had thought of was that, you know, find, develop a new system, uh, understand, you know, the, work out the kinks and then roll it out across a number of, of factories within, within a, a firm's network. While that might happen for small pieces of the process, the, uh, in general, what we heard was a, a need to really address plant level pain points. Um, and to sort of the non-value addict activities that are going on and build from the, the ground up in terms of addressing some of the introduction of some of these new technologies. And, and that that would be one way actually that you build buy-in from workers, from managers as well, to a new process, a new way of um, building capabilities and flexibility, et cetera, going forward. So uh, that was for us an interesting um, point of view and also one that suggests, you know, while things might be doing, being um, introduced in Germany in one way, they may not be, in, be introduced in uh, South Carolina in the same way or in Michigan in the same way as South Carolina. So there's a lot of variation that happens that comes from the ground up in terms of the introduction of new technologies. The second point, which everyone is um, well aware of, is we're collecting vast amounts of data uh, that uh, introductions of new sensors and cloud-based tools, et cetera, has led to tremendous amounts of data, but, and people are still trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, the data, you know, how do we make uh, smart data out of big data? It's one of the phrases that we hear. So the data is helping enormously on quality, efficiency, reducing waste. Um, people less focused, I think, again, with the large firms on automation, just because a lot of it has already been introduced. Um, but this has been, I think, this question of how, you know, how we use data to provide insight is, is really what the work, some of the work going on at MIT is really about. Um, and I think of a new, there's a new, I don't know if people are familiar with a new MIT effort, which is called the uh, Machine Intelligence for Manufacturing and Operations. I think um, perhaps Bruce, um, Bruce Lawler is on, on this today right now, but that's an effort um, specifically to figure out how to take the whole of the data um, collection process, the whole um, ways in which we're analyzing and bringing that knowledge to bear on manufacturing and operations um, at a time when firms are investing in this area, but not necessarily seeing exactly what to do. I, we interviewed one firm um, last year that had brought on 25 data scientists in the last year and was finding it, you know, was in the process of figuring out how best to use them and uh, not have them working on projects that, um, you know, would end up six months in some effort and then all of a sudden the, the, um, the problem they were trying to solve has gone away or they've moved on to something else. So some important areas to think about in terms of, in terms of data, data collection and how to use that well. 
this increasing pressure to be more flexible, I think that has been very much uh, on the fore of the COVID-19 response. But what we heard from a lot of uh, large, certainly, you know, suppliers is that there's just a continually uh, important emphasis on flexibility and responsiveness. And so that has implications for technology adoption, that has Im implications for workers and, and uh, training. But customers are wanting plants open 365. We want to see increased speed, but no increased costs. Uh, so this, this aspect of, um, of manufacturing going forward will accelerate, not decelerate, um, particularly, we think, in this, in this current climate. Finally, in terms of workforce skills, again, an area that we've been particularly interested in. And something we heard from the larger firms was this desire to meld uh, sort of the intergenerational skill set. So they want the adaptability and the familiarity with technology that the younger generation brings to the table, but they need the domain knowledge of the older workers. Uh, they need the older workers to help guide the younger workers because if something goes down, you need to have knowledge behind the monitor uh, as to what actually is going on and, and workers need to take responsibility for that. And if it's only an interface with the, um, with the um, tablet, if you will, uh, then the workers can't, won't necessarily take ownership and kind of what's happening behind that. So a very interesting um, emphasis on skills. And I would say also, while the concept of the lights out factory, you know, continues to be um, touted and, and, you know, examples here and there, on the whole, what we've heard from firms is that the lights out factory uh, doesn't lead to innovation, that you need workers involved to figure out how to improve systems, etc. And um, if anything, what we heard from a lot of these firms was that the new technology was really driving their thinking about how to redesign, sort of organizational redesign, um, changing cultures, trying to figure out how collectively uh, manufacturers can um, create a flexible, responsive, um, you know, skilled workforce and create what we heard from some firms, you know, create careers, not just jobs for the next generation. Now, from the perspective um, oh, of my last bullet point here. Um, again, this point I guess I wanted to make about labor supply issues in the long term will continue to be an issue for manufacturers. While we know that in the aggregate uh, production numbers, uh, employment declines, in the relatively short term, again, uh, this is sort of with a pre-COVID lens on, um, we see a shortage of workers uh, for in, in the manufacturing space due largely to that aging workforce. So how do we attract the new generation, provide the career, not the job, not just the job. Okay, let me move to the small and medium sized firm, which interestingly, we were somewhat surprised we did not see more automation, more robots than, um, than we did. So these were a lot of the um, metal manufacturing and, and firms that are in um, auto supply or uh, defense um, supply chains. And what we saw was, a, I'd say, sort of a layering of older, uh, newer technology on older technology. So have the old technology, throw on some sensors, generate some data, and then what to do with that data becomes an interesting question. Um, for those who are building new, new areas, green fields, you know, absolutely bringing in new technology, but most of these firms are dealing with, you know, brownfield um, automation, I meaning trying to bring automation to existing systems and technology, which is complicated uh, and can be expensive. And so, you know, why so few robots? Uh, if the robots are coming, why didn't we see so many of these um, in, the, in the Midwest and elsewhere? I think first and foremost, we know that a lot of this production is high mix, low volume for these firms. And so um, automation makes a lot of sense for high volume production, but when you need to be changing lines and changing perhaps um, you know, production being a little bit more flexible, uh, a lot of this, the technology did not make a lot of sense. The cost of equipment, of course, and lack of anchor customers who would secure contracts for multi-year um, investment, also an issue for the small and medium, uh, medium sized manufacturer, something that we've known for years since our work on the Product, um, the project that Ollie Dweck will be talking about next. Uh, 
Uh, inflexible technologies that a lot of these technologies still are not particularly versatile or flexible for uh, the small um, manufacturing setting. And the integration hurdle where lack of expertise in integrating and the resources and the expense and time that comes with integrating new technology has made it just not worth it for the small and medium sized firm. So we, um, we feel like the, the, the small and medium sized firms really provide uh, an opportunity if we can, if we could sort of tailor this kind of technology for them to advance and to invest in, um, in this technology would be a positive and a benefit for a lot of these manufacturing ecosystems. And, and, but, but there is, as we found in our um, work on the last project, the production and the innovation economy project, a lot of these small firms are quote home alone. How, how do they do this? How do they bring in new technology? How do they make investments? Uh, how do they innovate? All of that, um, often they're on their own trying to figure that out. Um, let me talk just uh, from now moving from kind of the firm level perspective on what we, what we have seen in terms of adoption of new technology and, and kind of the issues going forward. Let me turn to the ecosystem. Uh, what we call, you know, the ecosystem for, from our perspective is not just the firms that are operating in a, in a, um, re in a geography, a particular geography, but all the institutions that they in, engage in, with or that are involved in trying to advance manufacturing in the U.S. And what we've seen over the last um, seven or eight years, maybe the last decade, uh, is a diverse array of new institutional models. Uh, again, I'm speaking to the U.S., but I think you'd find this elsewhere in other countries as well, a really a reinvestment in trying to um, advance our, our um, capabilities in manufacturing. So the first area is R&D areas. So if we think about people are familiar with the um, Manufacturing USA institutes, these were set up um, somewhat along the lines of the Fraunhofer um, system in Germany. We have 13 of these institutes in the US right now. Um, MIT has been very involved in setting up of the one in the Massachusetts area, FOA, which is Advanced um, Fibers and Textiles. But a lot of different models in which we have collaborations and um, consortia created to, to promote R&D. So also at the state level, we see um, universities being involved in this. We have programs like in Massachusetts where the um, state government put $100 million toward trying to advance uh, manufacturing across a certain number of uh, different technology, technological areas. So really interesting areas of investment in the R&D side. Education and training also, lots of different models that have been, I think, experiments in different um, partnerships. We have AIM Academy, again, one that came out of um, MIT around laboratories that are combining con uh, higher education and community colleges around training. We have community colleges here that are moving from two to four year degrees. We have private companies like Rockwell Academy focused on retraining um, vets at, or Lincoln Electric uh, in Ohio trying to bring a whole new generation of uh, welding to, um, to the fore with, with new um, welding technology and augmented reality, et cetera. Also new associations, the, this is an example out of Ohio, the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition where there was a shortage of workers, there has been a shortage of workers in the Ohio area. And these, these uh, so association of uh, smaller businesses got together with community colleges to create the right curriculum. As an anecdote, we were out there talking to one of the state leaders in manufacturing about uh, the training situation and he said that they have, you know, at the, again, at the time, uh, were short 100,000 production workers in Ohio. And I asked him, you know, wow, that's a big number. How, how long have you known that? And he said about 20 years. And uh, the point is that uh, often the, the situation for training uh, the next generation has been sort of um, understood to be the role of the training institutions, the educational institutions. We see a lot of private sector uh, companies stepping up and saying, actually, we need to take some ownership of this and, and help lead in this area. The other area, of course, is, uh, is startups. We see both uh, organizations that are trying to promote um, hardware development uh, or even um, uh, hybrid software hard, uh, hardware products, whether that's through um, 
sort of uh, innovation startup centers like Greentown Labs uh, or Mass Robotics here in Massachusetts. We see VC firms, if people are familiar with Eclipse in California, others really focused on innovation and advanced manufacturing and opportunities there. So a lot of different ways in which these, are, these new models are, uh, are sort of creating opportunities for new manufacturing going forward and investments in trying to, certainly in this country, um, strengthen and build, rebuild our ecosystem, which for decades has been uh, largely um, you know, disinvested uh, in, in, in many ways. So, so I'm going to um, stop there. That is sort of the overview, I would say, of some of the research we've been doing and some of the key questions and, and topics we've been engaged in. Um, and maybe let me shift gears and move on, so uh, we also will have time for questions, to, this, uh, th to the, next, the next question about the future of manufacturing, at least in the near term, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID-19 and, and what we've been learning. And I'm gonna just perhaps bring some, um, some vision into what the, what the immediate kind of response to this, uh, to this crisis has been here in Massachusetts. So let me just talk about uh, a, response that I've been involved in and kind of had a front row seat to, which is what this state um, has been doing to try and respond to COVID-19 and, and particularly in the production of PPE. So the state of Massachusetts created the um, emergency response team out of an existing institution or, or entity called the Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative. I, I sit on this collaborative. This is essentially representation from firms, universities, um, government, uh, others that are, are overseeing sort of the, uh, an agenda and a strategy for, for the manufacturing uh, economy, if you will, in, in Massachusetts. The focus of um, MERT was to, is, is been to pivot uh, manufacturing for PPA. It wasn't focused on matchmaking per se. It wasn't focused um, on uh, ramping up existing production uh, for firms that was trying to particularly find how do we, uh, how do we scale up, well, how do we scale up some of the existing production, but how can we help firms pivot? So if people read about New Balance, for example, and their um, pivot toward making masks uh, very much happening here in the state of Massachusetts, uh, P&G, Gillette also involved, Raytheon also involved, a lot of large firms looking to pivot and help in the manufacturing of PPE. So it's been really interesting to watch this kind of uh, the network that exists ramp into, you know, uh, into action behind you know, one goal or several goals and bring all of the, the community to bear. So there have been through Zoom, Slack, et cetera, three, three calls a week that brought this uh, community together and several organizations that have been involved at various different levels. And so I'm going to just show the organizational structure, if people can take that in, but the state has had its own kind of command center in which the MERT has been feeding information into the command center, but also working um, directly with FDA and with manufacturers to try and increase um, capabilities um, in the state. So there's have four subgroups that are listed below, uh, understanding demand, which I can say has been you know, eye-opening, I'm sure for everybody who's been involved in this, just the enormous amount of demand uh, just in this, in this community and how, in a sense that that will just continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, regulation and testing, um, MIT and UMass Lowell taking the lead on that uh, with, with very close contact with the FDA. Design process, again, out of John Hart's lab in Mechie, uh, uh, Hayden Quinlan has been leading the effort to understand what actually was needed from a design point of view for, for various pieces of, uh, of equipment. And then manufacturing manufacturers, uh, who's out there, who can make it, how can we, how can we get more of it? Um, and again, the um, MIT has had a, a great role in that, uh, including a foe of the organization I mentioned earlier. So just a couple things about what has been addressed by the group. So uh, first and foremost, regulatory assistance, hugely important. I mean, there's no, for those involved in this, you know, I'm not saying anything 
uh, surprising here. This has been critically important to understand, you know, where F FDA was sort of uh, loosening some of their uh, regulations and standards and where they were insisting on keeping them quite um, rigid. The state as a buyer for some product, uh, as well as providing grants to companies, obviously this big, a very big challenge in trying to, with chicken and egg, trying to figure out how do you support manufacturers to make certain investments um, if the demand is not, you know, um, is not obvious or not clear or not um, sort of um, understood from a contractual point of view. Um, the importance of testing new and, and also imported products, anything that was coming into the state, Lincoln Labs has played an important role there, testing masks and other, other pieces. And then um, trying to support flexible, you know, the agility, flexibility of firms to pivot and respond. So there's an example here of 99 Degrees, which has been making um, high-end uh, garments uh, for the sports industry, et cetera, pivoting to making gowns now. Um, and, uh, and a real success story for the state. So the, um, a couple of the challenges just to talk about that I think are interesting from a, certainly from an NFT point of view, uh, we've got a lot of innovation going on, which has been tremendous. I'm sure people have seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of that in terms of PPE and certainly even at the, on an MIT's campus, but it's also created uh, a fair amount of noise, meaning there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things out there that aren't um, practical or aren't meeting certain standards. And so that's been a challenge to try and decide, well, do we spend time trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's in and what's out, or do we just keep moving forward with what we need to, you know, to get to the finish line here? Um, and this issue of, of course, you know, IP and the large firms holding a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, um, important details for how to, um, you know, how to engineer some of this. Um, how do we, in, the, in a moment of crisis, how do we you know, become flexible, but also make sure there are incentives for firms there. Uh, and then just uh, uh, the process of identifying products has been hugely um, challenging and uh, time intensive to understand sort of the, every little nuance to some of these products and understand from the, menu, from the medical prof um, professionals what's most useful, what really is essential for them. And slowly, I think the, the organization has not wanted to necessarily play, you know, the market has sort of started to, to formulate and to, and to show signs of, of uh, ramping up. The goal of the state was never to be making the market happen, but at least introducing people and, and identifying those who could participate in this, in this effort. So that, you know, feels like it's been relatively successful, but there's a lot of, a lot more to be learned and a lot more um, to do going forward. So I think that this will continue, but it will, it will morph into something that's more, uh, less um, responsive to it in the, real emergency of last month and more looking longer term into kind of the needs and opportunities going forward. So just to, um, to wrap up maybe and, and then leave some time for questions, um, I would just say, um, whoops, let's see, what have I done here? There we go. That as we look ahead and ask ourselves, okay, what are some of the things we see or we've learned about manufacturing going forward um, in, the, in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, again, these are points I think that are being made by many, and I would just reiterate from our point of view, a couple things that, that seem to be true. One is that the crisis has really exposed the loss of a lot of manufacturing capabilities in the US um, and an over-reliance um, on Asia, specifically China perhaps, for the production of key uh, products particularly around healthcare, but not just in healthcare. And I think that's, you know, that's something that is been, we've, we've been aware of this for decades, but in a moment like this, we have to really ask ourselves, is that where we wanna be? It's also in my mind highlighted the lack of a national manufacturing strategy. And I say that, you know, with, uh, you know, understanding that not everybody wants a, um, a top-down strategy, but I think when it comes to this, particular um, healthcare crisis, we have seen very little progress since the last crises. And 
you know, we have been in this place before, uh, at a, at a, um, at a less, uh, um, a less extensive level, but with the SARS crisis, with the swine flu, many of the same issues rising, coming up about how, um, how manufacturers can, with, you know, confidence be, start shifting and pivoting production. How long will that market be there? Hospitals constantly under pressure for cost savings. And then um, uh, essentially uh, we have not really figured out how to, how to solve this problem. And, and it, you know, unless we want to see ourselves in this place again in whatever decades, I think we really need to take that on. So a couple of thoughts about responses. Uh, certainly what we're hearing is that firms are thinking about um, dual sourcing at least to minimize their exposure uh, to China and that, that maybe this is the time we think about strengthening the healthcare supply chains in the US and which will take some commitment, some sort of long-term commitment from uh, government uh, to ensure that we have those capabilities in this country. Secondly, the investment in digital manufacturing to increase the flexibility and responsiveness. Firms who could do that, I think, have learned that they can do it and they've been uh, rewarded in many ways for that capability. So the, the opportunity for increasing the use of um, you know, cloud-based tools, et cetera, will be, I think, underscored by this crisis, uh, distributed manufacturing as well, and, and in some ways more robust regional manufacturing ecosystems. So to what extent do we think local production is begun, gonna become an important aspect of competitive advantage for healthcare, for example, or um, in some of these ways? So that's something um, we're watching. Question mark as to whether we'll see increased investment in automation, that is, you know, historically in moments of recession, we've seen firms have looked for ways to invest in um, automation and, and um, reduce costs. Will that be the case in this situation now? Um, it would be good to, to know what people think about that. Um, and then finally, uh, to the extent we talk about workers, we have seen uh, that our essential workers in this country whether they're on the manufacturing floor, whether they're in retail, whether they're in hospitals, uh, whether they're you know, cleaning uh, in our supermarkets, th these essential workers are in many cases, some of the workers who are, um, have the least protection, the least economic security of anyone um, in, in the country. And so uh, maybe this is a hopeful um, potential response, but, but hopefully this uh, reorients our, uh, our priorities and gives us a chance to support the workers that I've been so critical here, both in terms of their safety, but also in terms of benefits. A lot of workers have been excluded from uh, our labor market. We have a bit of a shadow labor market with respect to independent contractors, gig workers, et cetera, who have not had access to benefits, not had access to healthcare. And perhaps this will be sort of the, the moment in which we, we turn that around and we um, step forward and support workers um, in, in a meaningful way going forward. So I'm gonna stop there. And I think that leaves us about uh, 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, so I guess um, perhaps I will, there we go. I'll unshare my screen. Okay. Thank you. I've got, um, thank you for that. We have, uh, more questions than you can possibly answer, and some of them are really good. A lot of them are really good. What am I saying? Let <laughs> me start with with this one. Um, it's probably one that your colleague David Otter would would answer very well, but we're going to have to rely on you. And I know you'll do a great job. If there's an opening shortage, if there's an ongoing shortage of low skilled work, then why does the income of those workers not go up? In other words, keep up with white collar wage increases. Yeah, very, very good uh, point, uh, question, and, and raised, and yeah, as we should have the labor economist here, but I can say, I think with some certainty that we haven't, I think there's two things. I think we have, in some industries, we have, um, we have global competition that, uh, you know, at least in manufacturing, that has been a pressure for certain workers. But for the low-skilled worker, I mean, just we have a, a fairly strong, um, supply. We have a, a, a relatively large supply of low-skilled workers. 40% of the working age population in the U.S. has um, 
a high school degree or below. So for, for the low skilled worker, it just, it's, a, it's a job that often you can learn the skills you need in about, you know, maybe it's a month, maybe it's more, you know, how, how to work as the, in the, as the barista or how to, how to clean the building. And there isn't more to it than that. There isn't a long, you know, a longer career path. And that has been some of the challenge with these jobs. The, the hope is that we can find, you know, career paths that would help people increase skills and as a result, uh, earn higher wages. But the, I think it's a, it's, the issue is that we have a pretty significant supply at the lower skill level of workers. Got it. Uh, okay, the next one, um, and this one's been popular throughout your talk. Robots can't take your job if all the jobs are offshore to China. So how do you see robotic automation helping US manufacturers bringing production back to the USA? Do you have any numbers and trends to share? Uh, Okay, numbers and trends. Well, uh, that, you know, unfortunately, I don't have those particularly, you know, at my fingertip. What I will say is that we see, you know, the US actually lags in robotics adoption uh, relative to, say, South Korea or Germany or other places, though the rate is increasing. Um, and, you know, robotics, again, can both. Um, it both can reduce costs, obviously, that's what it's been done, used in the past for, but it also can augment workers. And that is, you know, the, the, the promise, the hope of the collaborative robot is that it's both, it's augmenting workers and increasing basically their value add. And in terms of U.S. competitiveness for manufacturing, that seems like a very positive outcome because as we know, when you take in sort of total cost um, uh, factors in, in the whole production process, China looks less and less uh, competitive from that perspective, uh, given um, you know, transportation, given um, wages that are increasing there, given IP issues. So actually the new, you know, if you look at sort of all the range of new technologies and the way in which firms are um, trying to or thinking about how to increase their efficiency, et cetera. That's, a, that's all positive for the US. That provides a wind at our back to be more competitive because of, because of this new technology. It may mean that we, um, on the aggregate, that that means fewer jobs in manufacturing, but it also may mean that we have opportunities for growing um, supply chains and growing manufacturing capabilities, particularly for, you know, um, the low volume, high mix products that um, that the U.S. is is known for. Great. Uh, related question then: How are countries such as Japan addressing their aging population and the increasing desirability of blue collar manufacturing work? Mm. It's a very good question, and I'm thinking, you know, there's some papers and things we should make available to people. Uh, a paper again, Daron Asimoglu did some comparative work on the adoption of of new um, of robotics across different countries. So, so if if we want to think about what our country will look like vis-a-vis uh, -vis this demographic crunch coming, uh, we just need to go and look at Japan and what they've been doing. Uh, they have adopted a tremendous amount of robotics with the idea um, that. Uh, they, their aging population really is, is, is a significant challenge, particularly they do not, um, you know, they have very little immigration that happens to that country. So they are relying heavily on that. And I would say in terms of how they attract workers into uh, the manufacturing, I'm not as familiar with what, what that looks like. I do think that they're, um, I think relative, I think wages are relatively high. And I think the career, obviously the Japanese have had a long tradition of providing um, long career paths for workers in the country at, at firms that um, um, stay relatively uh, loyal to their, to their workers. So I think that's probably part of how they've, they've maintained those numbers. But I think that they've, they've got a serious challenge in terms of, in terms of the workforce and in terms of the aging population and, and, um, robotics has been the answer. I will say, I think one of the really interesting points made by um, Rob Brooks, maybe some of you know, um, iRobot founder among other things, but his, he sort of his vision of what, you know, what does technology do, for example, for the home healthcare worker 
is not a vision of replacement. We, we would be hard pressed to say we're going to replace the home healthcare worker. Uh, you know, there's too many tasks that you have to do, but can you find ways to augment that worker uh, through, you know, lifting, physically lifting people, et cetera, um, managing um, people's intake of drugs, communicating with family and other things. So the vision there in my mind is one in which we see technology and, and boy, could we have used it right now where robotics, collaborative robotics um, technology is, is the partner uh, for the worker. And, um, and that to me is a model that um, is very compelling, certain, particularly in the healthcare space. Yeah, it's also a model I think that Japan got onto early, so that may be helpful for them. This one is near and dear to my heart, uh, Liz. Um, are high schools and colleges providing the right level of skills to be ready for this new era? Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, that is, you know, that is uh, an, a very important question. I will say that I think a lot of people have been focused on it and looking at this uh, from many angles. As a task force, we haven't taken on kind of a K through 12 lens um, because there are so many people looking, you know, at that. Our feeling is the most, the vulnerable population, particularly to new technology, are those between a high school education and maybe a two-year degree at a, a community college. And so that's kind of been the, the area we've looked at. I, I think that right now, some of the, what we know to be true, and we're seeing this right now, is we need institutions that are flexible and that's what, you know, industry wants. Uh, and that's what, you know, consumers want. They want to be able to you know, access education that's relevant and that is going to you know, lead to jobs. And so there are great examples, for example, IP, um, IBM has created the um, P-TECH program, Pathways to Technology, where they're partnering with high schools, um, kids who are in junior, senior year of high school, put them on a path which gives them education at a community college and hands-on learning in a, in a class. So for example, cyber tech, cybersecurity technicians. For the longest time, IBM has been um, hiring people with a computer science uh, bachelor's degree. And they've realized we, we really don't need that. It, we, we can actually grow um, these middle-skilled, middle, middle skilled, um, middle-class jobs with less than a BA. And I think that's a wonderful um, sort of experiment for us to be heading down and find the, the skills that are um, both providing kind of the fundamentals, you know, no, nothing's changed about reading, writing, arithmetic, that still is core, but layering onto it the new skill set that people need for the particular um, career or, or vocation that they're, they're going into. So I think we have a lot of experimentation, reinvesting in some of our vocational schools, um, again, some of this private sector models, um, higher education, that's a whole nother uh, topic. I think um, others would be in a better position to speak to that than I can. But I will at least say I see the, um, the vision, for example, that President Reif has put forward of the bilingual student. We need to be deeply knowledgeable about data and technology and deeply knowledgeable about uh, human, the humanities, human beings, social science. And that, to me, is a, a great vision. For, um, for higher education going forward. However, that's going to be provided in the near term. We'll see a lot I of- I know change. we have a, a task force meeting coming up and we're right at noon. I have one more question though, and it's really good if we can do it very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to what extent do you think the internet of things plays a role in future manufacturing? And do you think developing countries like India and Africa can cope with such technology full-fledgedly? Wow. Okay, I see that Ollie has just joined. I'm thinking I should uh, punt and hand that to Ollie for the next session. Um, but I guess, you know, um, what we, our task force has taken a global perspective on this, and there is this question about, you know, access to technology. There's a hopeful view that says there's a leapfrogging capability here, right? And that IoT actually brings a lot more opportunities to some of the developing developing world, but there's a tremendous of issues with vis-a-vis -vis skills and, and just a, a huge um, issue with in terms of education and skills. This is something Tavneet Suri has talked about in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and infrastructure, just ab absolutely investments in infrastructure. So the possibility there is there, the hope is there, the, the obstacles though are significant. So I'll have to jump uh, at this point in time. Great. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for staying a little bit late. Thank you for answering all of those great questions. And uh, we really appreciate it, Liz. All right. Thanks, Ron. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye.